I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's November 26th, and we have a lot to talk about. We're just a couple of days away from Thanksgiving in the United States, when friends and families come together and, amidst all the food and fun, take a moment to reflect and be thankful. And in the spirit of the holiday, I want to take a moment here to express how thankful I am for the brilliant and relentless researchers that I've come to know who are so deeply committed to solving the riddle of MS. I'm thankful that we've never been closer to finding cures for MS, and I'm thankful that today, MS can be better managed than ever before, lessening the burden of living with MS for so many people. I'm thankful for the clinicians who dedicate themselves every day to making life better for people with MS, and I'm deeply thankful for all the care partners who, too often, remain invisible as they take on thankless tasks and deal with the emotional burden that goes along with supporting a loved one who's living with multiple sclerosis. Of course, I'm especially thankful for each one of you for choosing to be part of the Real Talk MS listener community. You know, with Thanksgiving almost upon us, we're reaching the final days of National Family Caregivers Month, and I'm devoting this episode of Real Talk MS to my conversation with Barbara, Marina, Maya, and Matt. Four remarkable people whom I got to know when we gathered for a virtual roundtable discussion focused on what it means to be an MS care partner. November is National Family Caregivers Month, and today I'm talking with Matt, Barbara, Marina, and Maya, who are all members of an MS care partner support group. And so, Matt, Barbara, Marina, and Maya, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. As many of our listeners already know, I spent 23 years as my wife's care partner, so I feel very comfortable being a participant among this group. Why don't we start with you, Marina? Maybe you can tell us what some of your responsibilities are as uh, Harry's care partner. Okay, so I guess on a daily basis, um, I pretty much get him up, feed him. Um, that's the biggest thing I think is, is getting his meals there, getting them settled, um, every day in his wheelchair at the dining room table so that he can, um, he can't walk anymore. So he sits at the dining room table and works on his iPad or reads his iPad, finds shows to watch that kind of thing. And I have to help him with that because he can't, um, with his hands don't work well enough to really use a remote, um, or to type. So I need to help him with that kind of thing and get him settled. And then um, I can leave on a daily basis for a couple of hours. And then I come back and um, either, you know, take him to the restroom or do whatever he needs me to do, then make dinner and then eventually, you know, put him to bed. Now, before we got started, Marina, you shared with me that Harry, your husband, was diagnosed. uh, He's living with primary progressive. He was diagnosed in 1988. How have you seen his symptoms evolve over time? More specifically, maybe, how have you seen your caregiving responsibilities evolve over time? So over time, so at the beginning, he could still walk. He walked until he was able to um, uh, retire from work when he was 62. Um, And from that day on, he really has gone downhill because he didn't walk from the metro he was working in washington dc so walking became a little bit more difficult and the less he walked the less he was able to do so the more i had to take over um so all those duties i mean he really can't do anything anymore so slowly but surely i have really you know he can't get his own glass of water can't get his own plate can't get his own food i have to do all of that for him i have to help him brush his teeth um nights some nights i even have to help him eat Um, you know, by feeding him. Um, So uh, the fact that he really can't do stuff and can't also can't arrange any of his own appointments. I have to take him to appointments, um, doctors, whatever kind of appointment he has, um, help him with his glasses. He can't take his glasses on and off. So if he needs to take them off or whatever, he needs help with that kind of stuff. So he really needs help with everything. So I have to be someplace available. 
as much as possible. Same, same question, Barbara. You care for your husband, Michael. He was diagnosed about 10 years ago. He's living with secondary progressive MS. Uh, what are some of your responsibilities as Michael's care partner? Well, like I said, we do have a live-in um, aide who does a lot of the, you know, more personal stuff. And Michael, you know, is in a power wheelchair and really um, he can't use his hands anymore. So he needs help with everything. Our aide usually does the getting him out of bed and ready for the day, um, <clears throat> but he needs to be fed um, I do all the medication management, um, you know, needs to be set up. He also kind of holds court at the dining room table. Um, but, you know, we have his computer now is all set up on voice activation. So he's able to, you know, do more with that. But still, you know, I still need to like set things up for him at times and all. Um, he still, you know, has his phone also he uses the voice activation so he can make his own appointments. But you know, I have to take him to all the ologists and appointments that he needs to go to, which, you know, as you all know, become many, you know, between the neurologists, the urologists, the, you know, he, he also started going for speech therapy because his voice even has, you know, really diminished in quality. Um, and then, you know, he's not as able to project. Uh, so it's, so it's really, you know, and and everything in terms of maintaining the house. And the one thing he's still been able to really do is he does do some of the finances, which he has set up for, you know, on, on the computer and all. But it's, you know, I work full time um, and, you know, usually probably like 50 to 60 hours a week. And then it's like I come home and I still have everything, you know, to do around the house and help with him. Um, you know, I do the medication management because our aide is not allowed to really do that. Um, so it's a lot. You know, becomes a lot. And, you know, his mother is still alive who lives in Pennsylvania, but we still, you know, need to help her. He has two sisters, so we kind of have things set out. But, you know, Michael's responsibility kind of all of a sudden becomes like my responsibility <laughs> in terms of that. So, you know, it also goes to the next generation with that. Matt? You care for your wife, Diane, who's living with primary progressive MS. She was diagnosed about 33 years ago. Let me ask you, in that time, what have you found to be the most challenging aspect of being a care partner? There's a few things that come to mind depending on the day of the week. Um, I often say, uh, and people on this, on this, in this forum have heard it before, you know, caregiving is not rocket science and it's not, you know, individually hard. It's not hard to feed somebody. It's not hard to, you know, do some medication, things like that. But it's it's more of a this relentless, never being able to tap out. And and in, in harsher times, I refer to it as kind of a death by a thousand cuts. It's just it's just relentless. And it's all the time. And whether it be big things or small things, it's always there. Um, it's always there. And I think that's. Uh, that's that's the you know that's the thing that kind of kind of gets me that it's there's never opportunity to kind of say kind of take a deep breath and i mean that with somebody who's 40 hours a week upstairs that doesn't mean i'm sitting here kind of calm and kind of like you know 100 percent zoned in you know i always have an ear you know to see if somebody wants me i'm always doing reconnaissance if we're you know walking somewhere or going someplace new it it just never leaves I'll, I'll tell you uh, a, a little something that uh, I find to be true. I know that here we are. Uh, my wife uh, lost her battle with MS, passed away almost five years ago now. And still, when I get a text or my phone goes off, I grab that thing and look at it like, is it a hospital calling? Is it something having to do with her? So, so five years after the fact, frankly, uh, um, I still have my my ear to the ground as as, as you just mentioned, Matt. So I I, to I totally get that. You're, you're still wired for it, you know. I don't know what else to say. I mean, and that's what you know. Everybody on the call is the same way. I'm sure. You know, it's 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 always have an ear, or always have a you know, whether it be the middle of the night, and you know, my wife needs an adjustment, you know, or our knees bent, or or whether it be. Uh, you know, something that's, pro, you know, that, that's understood, like a scheduled something or whether it be non-scheduled, it doesn't make a difference. You know, you're on call, you know, 168 hours a week. Marina, same question. What have you found to be the most challenging aspect of being a care partner? I find that the most difficult part is really that I, I, I never feel 100% free. 
I, I go in the woods um, and walk my dogs, but I still have my phone on me. You know, I, I, I don't feel like I can ever leave my phone behind. And I have not gone away overnight for over 10 years. And that is really, um, so my son lives only two and a half hours away. He's up in Philly, but I don't feel like I can go up there for an overnight because Harry's not quite ready to be, to let me loose overnight. Uh, he, he wants me around. Um, so that has been, I think my biggest challenge is, is, um, yeah, it's just always being attached to my phone, which I, I really at times resent or don't, don't enjoy. <laughs> Maya, you have a slightly different perspective on this. Uh, your dad was diagnosed in 1984 with primary progressive MS. You're not his primary caregiver. But I'm curious from your perspective, and I'm sure you, you've, you've witnessed plenty, wh wh what do you see as being <clears throat> the most challenging aspect of being an MS care partner? Well, I mean, I think it's like what Marina, what you're saying resonates so much with me because that was you know, very much the situation that my mom was in. And so I think that I can't speak on her behalf, but it is that level of independence that I knew was so challenging for her to not be able to have at all times. I think that full autonomy is very important just for any person, you know, even for the, even for our loved ones who have it, I think that sense of autonomy and independence is so so important and so it feels really really um it can be dehumanizing in a way when that isn't constantly present and um i think for me one of the hardest things um as somebody who just loves somebody with ms is the same thing that actually matt was talking about is that constant awareness and an ear to the ground i think that there is just a certain level of alertness that we are programmed to have and that as you said even you know if the time comes that they pass on whenever it does it will you know we're all only human that that alertness is something that stays with us I, and i and i think the alchemizing of that the accepting of it and then the alchemizing of it is really really hard agreed barbara what surprised you about being a care partner? What surprised me? What has surprised you? Um, that's a good question. I guess a couple of things. Um, one of the things that was very hard for me initially was to ask and accept help from other people, which I've learned to do. And that's, you know, our community has helped us so much. Um, you know, I had just kind of started a, this, a new full-time job right when COVID hit and I had like lined up and, and what I found is so many people would say, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And if you gave them very you know definitive, concrete things, that was the best. And, you know, what I had said to them, which kind of went out the door with COVID, I said, you know, Michael's home alone or with an aide by himself all the time now. Can you call him once or twice a month and offer to come over and have coffee or lunch with him? You know, which I had like a dozen people lined up to do and then COVID hit. So nobody came. But I think that was one of the hardest things to do for that. And um, that and probably just kind of like just knowing that what you can do and what you're capable of things that like, I never did. Like I thought I was so proud of myself when I changed the toilet seat, like, <laughs> like, you know, silly things like that, that things that I just never did. And now all of a sudden, you know, either my job or I had to like call somebody outside the house to do it. So, you know, I'm surprised at like kind of the reserves you have when you need them and things you can do is, is probably the, those are probably the two big things. Matt, have you found that, being a care partner has changed your relationship with Diane? A little bit, a little bit. It's, it's important. My wife is, uh, my wife is, uh, it's tough to keep up with her. She's very active. Uh, she's an advocate for people with, uh, with needs. Um, she's, uh, and, 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 and we're partners. We're, we're, we, you know, we're, we're joined at the hip. I think that we've always we always kind of even you know when first married even pre kids I mean I think we all we still felt you know kind of like a give and take but I think there's more 
you know, there has to be more communication now because we need to make it work. It's it's not always easy, but I think that in, communication is important. And I think that we've kind of learned how to kind of open up on a dimension that we maybe never did before, you know, as we go through this journey. How about you, Marina? Have you found that being a care partner has changed your relationship with Harry? Yeah, it it has. I, I was actually just thinking that with us, it's kind of the opposite, I guess, because cognitively it's more difficult for him to do things. Um, so everything that he used to be able to do, he can't do anymore. And I have to do it. And um, I can ask him questions and stuff, but I don't I don't get a lot of answers back. Um, he doesn't talk a whole lot. He talks less and less. And and he gets confused. So even if I, you know, even when we talk politics, it's like what was just said, and he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily know. So I, I personally feel like I've really lost my partner in a lot of ways. In that, um, you know, we just can't go out and do stuff very easily. We can't. Um, I went into D.C. over the weekend, as a matter of fact, and uh, you know, we ran into somebody who was trying to find a, an elevator to go downstairs because his wife was in a wheelchair. So things have just gotten much more difficult. So you, there are things you just can't do as a as a couple after a while. And I think Matt does this stuff much better than we do. Um, my husband would rather stay home. He's much. He feels very safe at home. This is his little space, and um, it's a whole lot easier for him to stay here. So we don't go out for meals very much, um, or or never, just the two of us. But in, in some ways, I'm fortunate because my wife. My wife is, is, uh, there's no why me. There's nothing. She's just, she's very driven. And, and we're going to figure out a way to how to, how to, how to do what we used to do or want to do, even if we have to do it differently. Uh, we're going to do it. So, so I don't have, uh, I don't have somebody upstairs who's, who's depressed and wants to stay home and things like that. She's, you know, kind of the opposite. Uh, you know, how do, how do we get to where we want to go? How do we, you know, how do we how do we go see the kids? How do we go to this restaurant? How do we see friends? How do we travel? Um, you know, she's you know, we'll we'll you know, our attitude has always been and a very healthy one. Just we'll just figure it out in that way. I'm 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 very fortunate. You know, it's it's a different set of problems, um, you know, a different set of problems. Mm-hmm. But like Marina says, though, you know. You know, trying to negotiate this world with a with somebody uh, in a in a in a power who uses a power chair is just not always easy. Agreed. And somebody will tell you that something's handicapped accessible, and it's not by any means, and they don't necessarily understand what that means. Yeah, no, I've learned when I ask that to ask very specific questions. Right. I do too. So, yeah. so you know, if I can get into a into a story about you know what gets me. What gets me going? We were two weeks ago. We were up in up in uh, up in Boston for a uh, an event, and my wife and I did our you know particularly she. It was an alumni event for her, and we did a uh, we did our due diligence on where they were going to hold events, and where we were going to sit for things, and where we were going to have a you know a party and a dinner and et cetera, et cetera, and how we're going to get in, and where's the elevator, and all of this stuff. And um, we get into uh, Saturday night for dinner, and we knew that my wife had to uh, to transfer to her manual chair to get up a couple of stairs uh, into the into the venue. And uh, lo and behold, dinner's on the second floor without an elevator. And my wife and I individually just went nuts because we did our due diligence, and somebody else, you know. Or maybe more than one person dropped the ball, and um, it was it was incredibly frustrating. So, you know, what gets me going? You know, when I've done all that due diligence, and I'm I'm sure that we're going to get in because I've seen the pictures and I've talked to the right people, et cetera, et cetera. And then somebody has a brain cloud and says, "Well, now that you're in the building, by the way, dinner's upstairs." It wasn't my finest moment, and that's true going into doctors' offices too. I mean, they'll tell you that they have tables that will do anything or chairs that will do anything. And next thing you know, it's like, no, that that's not happening. <laughs> right. So right. even when we do our due diligence, we run into walls. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. Marina, what have you learned since you became Harry's care partner? 
Um, I've learned to be patient that I can, I'm a much more patient person than I ever thought I was. I've also, I, I did a lot of traveling as a, as a younger person and I'm finding that I don't miss that as much anymore. And I would have thought that that would have been a huge issue for me. It is an issue for me not to be able to go away overnight. Now, my background is being French and I can't go to France right now. I can't, I, I can't travel for any extended periods of time at all. Um, so, but I've just learned to deal with it and I've, I've learned that I'm okay with that. I, I have learned to make myself happier with everything I have around me. And I didn't know that would ever happen. How about you, Barbara? What have you learned since you became Michael's care partner? What have I learned? Um, that's a hard question. Um, you know, I've learned, I certainly learned to be more patient than I had been before. Um, you know, like I said before, I've learned that, you know, there are things that I never thought I would do that I could do when you're forced to do it. Um, and that, you know, sometimes life just really sucks and you just got to do what you can to get through it. And, you know, thankfully have, you know, friends and support who can help you through that. You know, we had this six, uh, this, con- this conversation about six, seven months ago on the call, maybe a year ago, I can't remember. And uh, it resonated with me. The answer to that question is I'm a better person. I'd be, I am truly a, a more empathetic person to anybody and everybody around me. You know, we t- like I said, we, we talked about it already, and, and that just mm-hmm. it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Maya, I'll ask you as uh, perhaps a witness on the scene or close to the scene, what did your mom do to keep herself emotionally grounded? Well, that is a great question. You know, I think one of the main rifts that actually stemmed between the two of us when I was uh, in high school and my dad was kind of at the very peak of not being able to be fully supported by my mom anymore. And that was when he moved into a facility. Um, It was that she wasn't taking care of her mental health as much as she should have been and wasn't taking the time to regulate her nervous system and and take care. Um, And so I think that now, thankfully, it's a lot different. I think she's definitely gotten more of her footing. Um, But I think one of the best things that she did was acknowledging that she is her own person fully. And I think that that took a certain amount of space. And I, I think it's it's a bit different from my mom because her and my dad are now separated. But I think that taking that space, whether physically or mentally, to be like, I know that I am my own person and I exist outside of my loved one, you know, I think that that was actually really, really helpful for her because then it felt like an active choice every day to be where she is and and where she was. And I think that that was actually really helpful. That's so hard because it's just so consuming taking over after someone. And one of the things that I found that I missed so much was I am never alone anymore. Like Mm. Michael, when he was working, used to travel a lot. And, you know, once our kids were out of the house, I would have times when I was like alone and it was great. And now it's like, I'm almost never alone. Like, you know, every once in a while, Michael have a friend will come and, you know, we have the accessible van and it'll like take him out to go somewhere without me. And he's always like, oh, do you want to come? I'm like, no, I just want to be home by myself. I do not want to come. Have fun, you know, go ahead. So it's like. You know, so I think that's really hard. And even like, you know, when you talk about physical space, mental space, because like you're always thinking, okay, you know, you know, what's what's going to happen? You know, I have to be on in case this happens or that happens. Or even like when you get sick, it's not like you can just like kind of take care of yourself. You're still on, you know, to help take care of that person. So it, it it is that that's a really hard thing to find your own space when you're, you know, so consumed with other people. Totally, totally. So what is it that you do for yourself, Barbara? Perhaps only in those rare moments when Michael gets taken away by a friend. But uh, what what do you, <laughs> what do you do to try to keep yourself a little grounded? I mean, I, I 
I've gone away a few times with friends, you know, always places that I could drive and get. I haven't flown anywhere like since he's really been, you know, in the wheelchair, you know, without, you know, and he he can't really fly now. Um, but you know, I've gone away for a few nights. Um, you know, when usually when I know one of my daughters is sort of in the area. So if something happens, she could get there first and then I could get back, you know, and that's that's helped for that. And um, you know, that's pretty much it. Matt, how do you think you benefited from being in this support group? Um, you know, I started I started the support, you know, I was probably uh you know, uh, I was probably first person in and, um, and I said, you know, I think that, uh, I think, uh, at the, at the urging of my wife, actually. And, um, uh, I said, you know, I've been at this a long time. 80% of it is maybe I can impart some wisdom. 10% is curiosity. And another 10% is maybe I can find something that I can glean from other people. And, um, while those percentages are are not necessarily true now, they're probably in the right in the right order, but it it just really helps to listen to other people dealing with spouses being a, a caregiver of somebody with MS. Okay, um, you know we know each other's stories, we know the differences, we know the similarities. You know we can hear things that say, "Hey, you know this I can relate to this." And uh, the, just the, the exchange that just kind of triggers something that says, hey, maybe this will work or maybe that'll work. Or, hey, why don't we talk and take this offline and I can tell you about my situation. I mean, it's just nice to have somebody, you know, a list of people that, you know, more than willing to hear. It's not, you know, there's, you know, it's undivided attention when they're on the call. We're on the call. And, and I certainly appreciate it. And like I've said, uh, you know, like I've said on the call, you know, not going to miss it. Not going to miss it. It's the one, it's one thing a month. I'm I'm just not going to miss. I count on it, and maybe people count on me. Marina, how about you? I, so one of the things that I wanted to link in there is Matt at one point told told me on one of these meetings that the minute our caregiver walks through the door or our you know our, our lady um, is to you go out or you go do what you need to do and. I, I, you know, there, there's a, you have to sort of let, let, let go of your control and just let them take care of stuff. And, I, and that was one of the most important things I've had to really adjust to and just know when she walks through the door, I come down here in my fabric world and I do whatever I need to do, which is part of my job, but also what I love doing. And I just know that she's upstairs and he's, she deals with him and I don't need to do that. And that was one of the most important things that I, it seemed obvious to me when Matt said that, but it was sort of like, yeah, but how does she know what he's going to need or whatever? And it's like, he does have a voice. And even though he doesn't always say what he wants, um, it's really important to let loose and let somebody else do the stuff if they can. And most people can, and they may not do it the way you want it done or the way he wants it done, but that's the way it is. And we all adjust to that. And I've got to say that now that I have started doing that, I can come down here for two or three hours, the three mornings she's here. And I don't even worry about what's going on upstairs anymore. And that was never true before. So that was one of the big things I got, but I, but I've been in another group also for 20, over 20 years. And just hearing people's stories has really helped. You, you, you get tidbits of information of and the other thing Matt had said, you know, if, if you think you need it now, you probably needed it six months ago. So when you <laughs> learning you need something do it now you know like the van or whatever it is and and that you sort of you know we don't know what's going to be day to day so sometimes it's better to be prepared and or you tweak as you go you know we learn we learn to tweak every day because we don't really know what's coming and that's (laughs) they don't have to be big tweaks but they're tweaks barbara what have you learned Uh, or or how have you benefited from being in a support just People that just really understand and get it when you talk about, you know, what you're dealing with. Um, you know, I've learned some very, you know, helpful things just about, you know, with, um, I, I think it was like with physical therapy and, you know, certain Medicare laws that have found. So you get information like that, but also just like the support that you get. I know, you know, I've talked to Matt offline on some of the things um, that we had questions about and he's been really helpful 
Um, you know, I kind of look to him as like just an example of, you know, a great way to be living your life. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm as always as patient as I should be. I learned to be more patient with Michael, but um, you know, it's it's really just having a group of people that you know understand what you're saying and get it. You don't have to like really go into a lot of detail to explain what's going on. So, you know, it's been, yeah, I was probably one of the earlier people who came on. And, you know, the first couple of months we actually met in per in, in person and then COVID started. And, you know, one of the nice things is we've been able to sort of spread, you know, geographically since we're um, you know, not meeting in person and just had more people. Um you know, involved in the group and just more perspectives. And, you know, you just never know when you're going to learn something important. So, Maya, someone listening to this conversation may be considering joining a care partner support group like this one. What would you say to them? I would say do it. I would say do it for sure. And I, I think that's because this is probably one of the first, um, This, I mean, this is like a really, really formative piece of, of a thing, you know, that goes into your psyche, loving somebody um, who is dealing with this illness, all of the, the dynamics that happen. It's just, I think for a really long time, it kind of felt like this unspoken thing. And that's a really, really hard cross to bear is to have something that's so huge and such a big part of, of my life to have felt like something that I never talked about. Because I was just, you know, in middle school and in high school and then I was in college and it just never came up like, oh, yeah, you you also have a parent who has MS, you know. And um, I think that it's just really important that the things that require, you know, the most amount of love are also given the most are given the most amount of attention. It, 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 this is something that helps to do that, you know, that we meet once a month, just to even just acknowledge its existence is so important. I think that that alone, I would say, just join it. Let's do that. You know, I, I'd like to add also that, you know, our ability to speak freely, freely to each other, because I don't necessarily feel I can speak freely to, oh, I don't know, my brother or my brother-in-law or some friends, because I'm never sure or I'm or the skeptic in me, I'm never sure what's going to loop back in the wrong, you know, be misinterpreted or loop back to my wife that I don't want her to hear. And there's not a lot of that stuff. My wife and I are, you know, open about all, open about just about everything. But there's, you know, there's things I just, I'd rather speak freely to to this group than to some other people. And you know, I'll 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 badger them with other things. But on this topic, I'd rather talk to this group of people. Well, Matt. Barbara, Marina, and Maya, I want to thank you for stepping up and taking on an often invisible and frequently challenging role, but it's a role that can make all the difference in the world to the loved ones you care for. And thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society, and you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 378. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum, wishing each of you a safe, happy, and healthy Thanksgiving. <laughs>